welcome to the section on psychiatry. I'll be taking up the recall questions of NEET PG 2023 exam today with you. So as you had expected, you got about four questions from psychiatry this time. So the usual pattern says that you get four to eight questions from psychiatry in every such exam. I'll be taking up each of these questions one by one and also be taking up the specific topic for a detailed discussion in today's session. Let's start with the first question. So you got a question here saying that a patient of schizophrenia was first started on haloperidol and thioridazine. So this question gives you a clear diagnosis of schizophrenia. So you really don't have to figure out as to what the question is talking about. So now the question says that the patient had been tried on two antipsychotics. The first one being haloperidol and the second one being thioridazine. Then the question says that the patient was not responding to these medicines. So, the question is hinting towards a case of treatment resistant patient. So, if the diagnosis of schizophrenia is here, so this will be a patient of treatment resistant schizophrenia. Then the question says that the patient was switched to another drug. After switching to this drug, the patient developed certain side effects. What are these? hyperglycemia, dyslipidemia and excessive salivation. So, the question is asking you to delineate or mark the offending drug out of these four options. Let's look at the options first. The first option is clozapine, the second one is risperidone, the third is aripiprazole and the fourth one is ziprasidone. So, all the four options are all antipsychotics. So, just reading through these options will definitely not give you an answer to your question as to which could be the offending drug. So, what are you expected to know by the examiner is the adverse effect. So, clearly out of all these four drugs, one drug is the offending drug which has all of these adverse outcomes. So, let us see which one could be out of these. So, if you look at the specific side effects, the question is hinting towards a diagnosis of metabolic syndrome or certain amount of metabolic side effects along with problem of increased salivation. Out of all of these drugs, only one drug is the one which fits in this box of having all of these side effects and the answer to this question will be clozapine. Let's see how this works. So, clozapine is a drug which is a dibenzothiazepine group pharmacologically. It acts via antagonism of serotonergic receptors and dopaminergic receptors. What is different about clozapine with regards to other antipsychotics is that it has low occupancy or no occupancy of D2 dopaminergic receptors, which is why the extra pyramidal side effects are minimal with clozapine. Also, it acts by low occupancy of dopaminergic receptors. By that, I mean to say that if a usual antipsychotic has to occupy at least 60 to 70 percent of dopaminergic receptors, this drug clozapine acts by occupying less than 50 percent of dopaminergic receptors. With this, we understand that even while the dopaminergic occupancy of this drug is low, its effectiveness manifests at that low level. So, the patient has less of extrapyramidal or Parkinson-like side effects. So, where do we use clozapine? Clozapine is used in the management of psychotic disorders like schizophrenia, a schizoaffective disorder, management of treatment-resistant cases of a bipolar disorder like mania, then there can be management of severe psychotic depression with clozapine. You can also manage certain movement disorders like dyskinesias and idiopathic Parkinson-like symptoms with the use of clozapine. Obviously, it is also used for the management of movement troubles in patients with Huntington's disease. Why should we be worried and or why has clozapine been kept last in the list of the antipsychotics that are available to us? This is because of specific side effect profile clozapine has. So, what side effects clozapine has? It leads to siloria or hypersalivation. Why does this happen? It reduces this 
reflux, swallowing reflex, which is why the patient while asleep is not able to swallow his sputum, which is why there is regurgitation or uh, spilling over of this sputum leading to wetness of the pillow while the patient is asleep. This leads to the phenomena of siloria or hypersalivation. There is also anticholinergic effect which leads to these uh, hypersalivation in these patients. Clozapine has higher amount of sedation as compared to other antipsychotics which is why also uh, you have to understand that patient with clozapine also will come to you and complain that sleep time has increased significantly. Patient might also complain of dizziness or postural hypertension, syncopal attacks. There will be increase in heart rate. Patients usually have sinus tachycardia. Then patient can have hypotension, fatigue, weight gain and GI symptoms like constipation, nausea and vomiting. Now, with weight gain also you have to understand that the thing that I mentioned there as metabolic syndrome, patients put on clozapine will need monitoring of their sugar profiles, then they also need monitoring of their lipid profiles, body weight and waist to hip ratio because clozapine alters the metabolism in the body which can lead to these significant adverse effects in the long term. Patients can have anticholinergic side effects, then they can complain of muscle weakness. Another significant thing that you have to remember about clozapine, which can come to you as a question, is its side effect of leading to leukopenia or granulocytopenia. It reduces the cell count of granulocytes in the peripheral blood picture. So, you have to understand that this patient who is put on clozapine will need monitoring of blood cell counts especially the leukocyte count. So, you should monitor your patient on clozapine with a TLC. It should be done every week for the first six months and after the patient has been taking the drug for six months or so, this can be done every 15 days or fortnightly for more than six months of duration. Now, these monitoring challenges are the ones which make it difficult for a person to be put on clozapine, let's say as a first line choice of treatment for schizophrenia. So, important drug here is to be remembered is clozapine and its specific adverse effects. You usually get these questions, this has been asked in the previous years as well. So, please remember the effect profile and the side effect profile of clozapine, it is often asked to you as a question. Let's move on to the next question. This question talks about an anxiety group of disorder patient. So, the question says that a middle-aged woman presented with episodes of sudden onset breathlessness, palpitations, tremors, sweating, fear of having cardiac arrest for 6 months, increased heart rate, 5 to 6 similar episodes occurring every month, no triggers for such episode and each episode lasting for about 30 minutes. What could be the likely diagnosis? Now, as you can see the clinical picture of this patient, a female in the middle age is having episodes. She has episodes lasting about 30 minutes occurring in a frequency of 5 to 6 per month. So, clearly an episodic illness has to be identified in the options which can lead to an answer to this question. So, what are the options that we have? The first one says a panic disorder, obviously it is an episodic illness. Then the next one says that it is a depression. So, a depression is obviously it is an episodic illness but there are no short lasting episodes. An episode of depression will usually last in a continuum of 2 to 3 months not merely 30 minutes. Then the third option says that the patient has generalized anxiety disorder. So, as the name goes, generalized anxiety disorder will mean that there is something that is persistent and pervasive. Again, this does not hint towards an episodic illness. So, this will also be not the answer to this question. Then the last of the options is a seizure disorder. So, as you understand, a patient with let's say partial onset seizures can have a prodrome of anxiety. But obviously, the question in that case will give you a description of an epileptic attack, a significant 
uh, tonic-clonic movement or any other specific history of a focal seizure. But this question does not give you a specific history of patient having an epileptic attack. So obviously seizure is ruled out, out of all these options. So even if you look only at the clinical picture, you are able to delineate that this patient has a panic disorder. So what are these episodes that the patient is having? These are called as panic attacks. And if a patient has recurrent panic attacks over a period of time, which is more than one month, that will be referred to as a panic disorder. What you have to understand here is that a diagnosis of panic disorder should be made only in the absence of significant precipitating trigger, in which case that will become a diagnosis of, let's say, a phobic disorder. Somebody sees a lizard and freaks out, has a panic attack after seeing that insect. So, obviously, if there is a trigger, you have to answer to that question as a phobic disorder, not a panic disorder. Let's see a panic disorder in detail. A panic disorder is a recurring, occurring illness where there are attacks or episodes of severe anxiety. These are not restricted, mind you, these are not restricted to any particular situation or a set of circumstances and these are largely unpredictable. So, these are not limited and these are not predictable. They can have happen out of the blue. These are certain keywords that you have to know while learning any kind of disorder so that you can actually pinpoint which is a clue that you have to pick to arrive at your diagnosis. Then a panic disorder will have comparative freedom from anxiety between the attacks. Vis-a-vis, -vis, if you compare it with a person with generalized anxiety disorder, that person will have a persistent free-floating anxiety all the time. But this person with a diagnosis of panic disorder will be symptom-free in between the episodes. Then a panic disorder as a main diagnosis should be made only in the absence of phobias as I have already told you. Minimum duration to arrive at a diagnosis should be at least one month. This is uh, according to both the systems of classification, both ICD and DSM. Coming to the generalized anxiety disorder, anxiety here is generalized and persistent. It is not circumscribed or restricted. Then it is free floating. This is the key word that you have to know. Panic disorder happens out of the blue. Generalized anxiety disorder is a free floating kind of a condition. And obviously, you will arrive at a diagnosis if it is persistent for a longer time, not merely one month. Let's see the third question. This says that there is a history suggestive of premature ejaculation in a male patient with history of relationship conflicts with his wife. Non pharmacological treatment for this condition. So, Clinical hint was given to you of a patient having premature ejaculation and you were asked to mark non-pharmacological strategies for managing this patient. Let's see the options. The first one says that cognitive behavior therapy is effective. Second one talks about exposure and response prevention. Third one says that squeeze therapy is beneficial. And the fourth option says sensate focus technique is useful. Now, these are very specific techniques that this question has given to you, right? The examiner is wanting you to understand or to know as to what specific treatment is effective here in a case of premature ejaculation. I would say that this is tougher as compared to the previous two questions because you are required to know all of these techniques specifically and only then you will be able to arrive at that diagnosis. So, the first one is cognitive behavior therapy. So, cognitive behavior therapy as you would know, is a technique which defects the cognitive problems for any patient, let's say a patient having depression or anxiety, so that coping strategies can be enhanced and patient can come out of that trouble. This specific technique is not limited to any sexual dysfunction. This is used for severe kind of psychiatric illnesses like depression, anxiety, personality group of disorders and so on and so forth. The second one exposure and response prevention is a specific kind of behavior therapy technique which is effective in patients with obsessive compulsive disorder. What is exposure and response prevention therapy? As the name goes, you expose the person 
to the obsession to the obsessive instinct which kinds of creates discomfort to the patient and leads to manifestation of compulsions so let's say a patient is there with ocd having a problem with dirt and contamination that patient will be exposed to a lot of dirt and would be asked during the session not to respond by washing so the patient will have to bear that amount of anxiety for the duration of the therapy session let's say about 30 to 40 minutes and gradually the responses are put off and the patient is able to tolerate those exposures so exposure and response prevention therapy is a behavior therapy technique specific to ocd next in the list is sensate focus technique sensate focus technique as you can understand again with the name of this technique you are trying to focus on a sensory stimulus so this kind of a technique is used for a person who has a problem with initiation of a sexual contact or you can say that this person has lack of desire so obviously as you can understand the way i am putting it to you this technique is effective in a sexual dysfunction patient but it is effective for a person who has problem with the initial act or the initiation of the act of sexual contact this person does not have specific problem with the orgasmic dysfunction or premature ejaculation as you see in this patient so what happens here instead of focusing on the genitals the partners are instructed or trained to focus on the other sensory sensitive areas of the body and make the partner the other partner have arousal or initiate the enjoyment of that sexual pleasure so with this technique you are trying to put off the dysfunction which is related to the initiation or desire of involving in a sexual activity right so this is not again the answer to this question so the answer to our question is squeeze therapy i'll take this up in detail in the subsequent slides so squeeze therapy is something that delays the ejaculation in a male person when the person has a problem with premature ejaculation let's see how it works so premature ejaculation is an orgasmic disorder as i told you this person has desire to involve in a sexual activity and hence does not need a sensate focus technique the person wants to involve in a sexual act but this person has a problem with management or the attainment of orgasm and having it for a sufficient amount of time so this is an orgasmic disorder of sexual functioning in a male person where ejaculation happens earlier than the attainment of peak orgasmic experience so the ejaculation occurs much early as expected by the person how do you manage this kind of a person with premature ejaculation obviously you have drugs to help the patient and there are certain non pharmacological techniques what are the non pharmacological techniques the first one that was there in the, our question also is the squeeze technique how does it work it's as simple as the name goes the female partner of this person is instructed to squeeze the penis as soon as the male partner experiences imminent desire to ejaculate during the penetrative course of the activity so the partner forcibly squeezes the coronal ridge of the glands to diminish the erection and inhibit ejaculation now what will this do obviously this will inhibit or prevent ejaculation to happen because you have obstructed the orifice this raises the threshold of sensation of ejaculation inevitability and allows the man to focus on the sensations of arousal now gradually over time when the couple practices this squeeze technique the amount of time that the couple is able to spend in the penetrative act is increased and ejaculation is put off to a certain amount of time gradually the amount of time needed for ejaculation increases and this no more limits itself to being a premature act so obviously the couple is able to enjoy the orgasmic act for the sufficient duration of time what else can be done in such a case you can also do a start and stop technique so here the couple was asked to squeeze the penis right at the time when there was imminent desire to ejaculate but here what happens is they try to pause the act of sexual engagement as soon as they understand that ejaculation is about to happen 
So obviously here the male partner has to understand that he is the one who has to be in charge of this start and stop technique. The sexual act has to be paused for that brief time when the partner feels that the patient, the male person is about to ejaculate. So if you take a pause, obviously the ejaculation will not happen and then you can rejoin the act again, obviously, and this will delay your ejaculatory effort. What are the pharmacological techniques? Obviously, I am putting this here because these also come as questions in a similar way. So, you can be using an SSRI which delays ejaculation like depoxetine or there can be a use of norepinephrine dopamine reuptake inhibitor like bupropion which also delays ejaculation. Sensate focus technique as I told you is used in the management of disorders of failure of genital response where the initiation of the sexual activity is a problem in either of the partners. Last in the list is a question from substance use disorders. This question says that a history of chronic alcohol abuse was there in a person who is now presenting to you with acute onset of confusion, sixth nerve palsy and ataxia. What could be the likely diagnosis in this case? Now, you have to understand each of the keywords here. The first one is a chronic alcohol use. So, out of all these options, if there is something that is hinting towards an acute alcohol use problem, that obviously will not be the answer to this question. Then the patient is also presenting to you with a specific set of symptoms. What are these? There is a sudden onset, acute onset of confusion along with nerve palsy or nystagmus and ataxia. So what is the likely diagnosis? The question is asking you to arrive at that. Let's see what among the options are the acute conditions. So, delirium tremens and alcoholic hallucinosis are two specific things which occur due to acute alcohol use. They are not limited to chronic alcohol use. So, out of all of these four options, you can straight away be sure if you know all of these things that these two cannot be the answer to this question with a chronic alcohol use problem. So, the answer should be between the options B and C, Korsakov psychosis or Wernicke's encephalopathy. Let's see. Acute Wernicke syndrome is a medical emergency. What happens in Wernicke syndrome? So, if this person has been using alcohol on a long term basis, he is bound to have certain amount of nutritional deficit. What is the specific deficit that this question is hinting towards? Is something related to thiamine deficiency. Thiamine, as you know, is a coenzyme or a cofactor in many of our metabolic processes like Krebs cycle in the form of enzyme, uh, coenzyme thiamine pyrophosphate. So, deficiency of this thing will lead to a problem with the metabolism in these patients. So, these will develop in a, on a long term syndrome called as Wernicke syndrome. What happens in Wernicke syndrome? You have ocular muscle paralysis because obviously the lateral rectus muscle is affected. So, this patient will have nystagmus, strabismus or gaze paralysis. These patients will also develop other cognitive side effects like ataxia, confusion and drowsiness. So, you can remember this as an acronym GOA, global confusion. Ophthalmoplegia and ataxia. This is the answer to our question. This patient has confusion, ophthalmoplegia in the form of ocular muscle paralysis and ataxia. Why this is happening? This can also come as a question. This is because of thiamine deficiency, which is the cofactor, the thiamine pyrophosphate. It happens in a long term case, obviously. It's an emergency kind of a condition because it can turn out to be fatal. Now, it occurs within two to three days of last alcohol use. Let's say somebody has been using alcohol for about a year and then he is not able to use it for two to three days uh, in specific. Then this patient can have the onset of Wernicke's syndrome. Mortality is there in as many as 20% cases of Wernicke's encephalopathy. How do you treat such a patient? Obviously, you know what is the problem. That is thiamine. You supplement thiamine parenterally. Right, you give IM stat and over a period of time in the form of IV infusion, and then you continue it for a period of time, keeping the patient admitted with you. 
and then subsequently the patient can be discharged with oral thiamine supplementation. Also, you will have to manage the withdrawal symptoms of alcohol use. If this patient does not present to you, obviously with Wernicke's encephalopathy, it goes unchecked and the patient subsequently comes to you at a later date, the patient can also develop what is called as Korsakoff syndrome. This occurs later than Wernicke's. It is more florid cognitive problem where the patient will come to you with memory problem, problems with learning, right? Patient can have frank psychotic symptoms also. So, if the symptoms look to be acute in nature, it will have to be Wernicke's. If they are more chronic in nature with a patient with chronic alcohol use, you can arrive at a diagnosis of Korsakoff syndrome. That's quite simple and straightforward. So, let's see what the other two acute conditions that were mentioned there. Alcoholic hallucinosis was mentioned. What happens is, if the patient has been using alcohol, so within 8 to 12 hours of abstinence from alcohol, the patient will have transient hallucinatory phenomena in the form of visual, tactile or auditory hallucinations. Patients can have certain uh, brief illusions also. Patients can also develop delirium tremens or DT. It happens about uh, in uh, 2 to 3 days of time after last alcohol use. And the patient can present to you with clouding of consciousness or disorientation to time, place and person, poor attention span and distractibility, certain hallucinations and autonomic disturbances. So, all of these put together can lead to a phenomena of delirium tremens. Again, as I said, it is an acute condition, not a chronic one. These patients will need benzodiazepines to manage this condition of delirium tremens. Right? What you also have to know is that possibly there was another fifth question in the paper that was asking you as to what is the offending agent in a patient with Wernicke's encephalopathy. In that case, the answer again would be thiamine as I have already discussed. Hope you had a good exam. Thank you for today.